Less than six months ago, Jody Wilson-Raybould was a prominent member of Justin Trudeau's cabinet. But then the biggest political story of the year happened, and she was at the center of it, alleging repeated attempts within the prime minister's office to get her to interfere in the SNC-Lavalin criminal case. Turf from caucus for what Trudeau called broken trust, Wilson Raybould is now an independent MP who announced this week she will run for re-election in her Vancouver riding this fall as an independent candidate. And Jody Wilson Raybould joins me now in studio. Hi there. Nice Hello. to see you. Thanks for coming in. Pleasure. Happy I appreciate it. If you hadn't been kicked out of caucus, would you still be running in the next election as a liberal? Absolutely. I was the uh, confirmed liberal candidate for Vancouver Granville, and I was confirmed back in the fall of 2018. So I guess what I mean by that question is yesterday you talked a lot about not being part of this sort of the establishment, not not being something that fits into party politics. But if Justin Trudeau hadn't kicked you out, you would still be doing all of that. I, I mean, I would have been the liberal candidate. Um, that's not to say that my um, belief or my aspirations to do politics differently would have been different. It'd be the same. I'm the same person that I was back in, in 2015. Um, actually, before that, in 2014, when I decided, which was a really tough decision for me to make, to get involved in federal politics, I actually believed that there was a way that we could do politics differently, that we could take away as much as we could the partisan nature of politics politics to be able to work across party lines to tackle tough decisions. That's who I was then and that's who I am now. And I have, um, as a result of my decision, as a result of being ejected from the Liberal caucus, have had opportunity to talk about that. And I think it's an important conversation. Um, it's been reflected back to me uh, by thousands, over 15,000 pieces of correspondence into my um, into my emails and into my writing office about people talking about the same thing and, and wanting to uh, ensure that our political process is effective um, and effective at delivering on solutions that are arisen or that arise that we come to as members of parliament as much as possible across party lines to address Indigenous reconciliation to address climate change and uh, other important issues that are only going to be resolved and have longevity if we do it in as much as we can a nonpartisan way. If Justin Trudeau weren't the leader of the Liberal Party, would you consider running under the banner again? Well, I, I really don't like to speak in hypotheticals or think in hypotheticals. I'm very comfortable with where I am right now and the announcement to run as an independent candidate in Vancouver Granville um, and represent my constituents. Um, you never know what will happen in the future, but uh, I'm uh, going to work really hard over the next uh, number of months leading up to October. Do you think they should, do you want them to win the next election? Do I want the Liberals to yeah. win the next election? I want to um, voters to decide um, the best member of parliament to represent them in every riding across the country. I will say this. I, I mean, I, I ran as a Liberal in the last election. I believe in progressive policies. I identify with the um, as closely with the ideology of the Liberal Party in terms of, of equality and justice and addressing um, issues of inclusion. Um, that's still who I am. I am hopeful that voters will uh, be engaged, will be informed, and will vote for um, the individuals that will best represent the significant challenges that we have. And as an independent candidate, I really hope that we see more independent conversations, maybe independent candidates, but particularly independent partisans. It doesn't matter if you're a member of a political party, but to move beyond the partisan nature or the divisive nature of politics to address significant issues, I think, is the direction that we're heading. I want to ask you about that nature in a second, but uh, the reason I ask about it, whether or not you hope that they win the next election, is because due to what's happened over the past few months, you know that the Liberals have taken a huge hit in the polls. The, the odds of them winning the election ha have changed. There are further questions that, that arise from your decision to work to run as an independent in that could the progressive vote in, for example, your Rodney or Jane Philpotts be split even further? Are you, in effect, helping the Conservatives win the next election? And how do you feel about that if that's the case? 
I don't see myself as, as helping the Conservatives win the next election. I think it is problematic when we consider um, voting and vote splitting or we consider people's votes and putting them into um, different boxes or that the vote of Canadian, a Canadian or Canadians is owned by three parties. I really want to um, do everything I can to provide the voters in Vancouver Granville with an option. Um, again, I consider myself a progressive. I believe in, in uh, um, a bold approach to climate change. I talked about um, the Green Party approach. Um, there Does is that an, put you at odds though with Andrew Scheer? Like you said you could work with anyone in government. Does that, for example, climate change put you at odds with Andrew Scheer? Well, I will, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, work with anybody that forms, uh, is the prime minister. I am committed to doing that. I would be committed to working with all members of parliament, regardless of their political stripe. Um, there are... Um, uh, again, I'm a progressive. I do not necessarily identify with the ideology that the Conservative Party is bringing forward. But you'd be willing to work with an Andrew Scheer-led Conservative government? I think that all members of Parliament, regardless of their political stripe, has to work with whomever is the government at the time. Um, 338 people are sent by their constituents to the House of Commons to do the business uh, that Canadians sent them there for. There are some serious issues that have to cross partisan lines to be addressed. If you truly believe that you know MPs should be more independent, should speak more independently, should be less partisan, why didn't you speak out when your government broke its promise on electoral reform? Well, I, I mean, I, I had, uh, I had the great pleasure of being uh, a minister of the crown for for over three years, and and I said yesterday when I was um, speaking to my constituents, we accomplished many um, important initiatives. Uh, we passed legislation and created and policies, um, and I don't. Uh, I want to hold that up and, and acknowledge that. Um, but I was a member of cabinet, and cabinet makes decisions. Um, there are discussions that happen in the cabinet room. Of course, I can't talk about those discussions, but when uh, cabinet makes a decision and cabinet comes out, then uh, cabinet uh, ministers uh, uphold the decisions that were made. And that one of those decisions was around electoral reform. Um, having said that, when I ran to be a member of parliament and started in 2014, um, I believe the discussion around electoral reform, democratic reform, around parliamentary reform particularly um, in recent months is an incredibly important conversation to have. And I think it's one that we need to um, have leading up to the election to ask um, party leaders um, what their views are. Because I know that there are... Uh, a huge amount, a majority of people in Vancouver Granville, when I knocked on the door, they were very disappointed about the decision um, to not move forward with, with democratic reform. And that is important. And, and as their representative, I'm going to continue to advocate for that. So I guess I ask, though, again, because you're, you're, yesterday you and Jane Philpott both mm -hmm. talked about democratic reform. And obviously that changes the way you know who who people vote for and how they how much vote how much weight they feel that their vote carries and uh, yes you were in cabinet but there have been cabinet ministers in the past who who spoke out and said said other things uh, obviously on other issues you felt like you could uh, why didn't you publicly say that you were not supportive of that i mean that goes to the heart that issue of independence goes to the heart of what you're advocating for right now no, well, I'm not disputing that, and, and I. But I will say that there is uh, a principle, an important one, of cabinet solidarity, and that applies to to democratic reform. Um, I uh, feel free to speak out on issues where um, I have spoken out leading up to becoming involved in federal politics, um, and continued through when I was a cabinet minister and continue to this day. So I'm not going to not speak out about how I think particular issues should be addressed potentially differently than how the government is currently doing it. One of those areas is around uh, Indigenous issues. Um, but it's important as an independent to continue to speak uh, for and on behalf of the, the, not for, on behalf of the constituents of Vancouver Granville and, and how they want to approach issues, see issues being addressed to be able to relay that. And as an independent, I have uh, the freedom to be able to do that unencumbered. On that, you said yesterday that you, uh, you will no longer be, quote, dictated to or told what to do by non-elected individuals that work in offices. Do you think that's what your former cabinet colleagues are doing right now? Are they just puppets for the PMO? 
Well, I'm not going to, um, I can't pass judgment or, or say what my former colleagues think. Um, I believe that our political environment has, um, needs to be pulled back. And what I mean by that is that there is a very hyper-partisan nature um, that exists here around discussions, around decisions, around issues that have a different perspective depending on the party that you're talking to. And that's okay. But it it's not okay when it gets to the point of preventing having conversations to break down those barriers or to try to, as much as possible, eliminate the conflict for the sake of conflict, for political expediency as we lead into an election. There are some issues, um, and I've heard many times from people that say, you know, the best public policy uh, is to get reelected. Um, I don't ascribe to that. I think that we need to ensure that we have conversations across cross party lines to make decisions on issues and bring the best of all of the individuals that sit in the House of Commons to try and solve them. But is that what you're is that what you're saying is happening right now? Are you saying that they're being told what to do by non-elected people in offices? I think there's an element of well, I don't think there there's an element of that. Um, there is a lot of power that is placed on the center unelected um, individuals, uh, interest groups that impact decisions that are being made. Um, uh, I, I can't imagine anybody disputing that that is the case. Um, we need to ensure that we move away from that centralized power where, um, as an example, um, members of parliament are accountable to the prime minister. Um, of course, we as members of parliament are accountable to our constituents and we need to figure out a way that the voices of each individual constituent can be reflected um, through their member of parliament to make public policy. I haven't spoken to you at all since everything that happened. Uh, you weren't available for an interview. So, so I do want to ask more generally sp speaking after everything that, that happened with SNC-Lavalin. Is there anything about the way uh, you conducted yourself or your actions that you regret? That's a good question. I, and I've thought about it a lot. Um, I regret the place that we're in now and that it had to come to this place. Um, I um, am confident and comfortable with the actions that I took as the Attorney General and the stance that I took to ensure that the uh, independence of the Director of Public Prosecutions and their discretionary power was upheld. Um, I, so I don't regret actions that I took, have, and ta and took personally. Um, I think that there are many lessons that can come from the f last five months and the discussion, and I know it was um, in the headlines for the better part of months and months and months. Um, we had a discussion about fundamentally democracy and the tenets of our democracy about the rule of law and about the independence of our institutions. It's a really important conversation that we were having, separating it out from discussions around um, SNC or deferred prosecution agreements. Uh, I mean, I'm very comfortable with um, where I was throughout that conversation. I provided all of the relevant information um, through my testimony at the Justice Committee and in subsequent written submissions that I made. Um, and I know as we come out <laughs> from that um, dialogue and, and discussion, uh, I have received many messages from people that are thankful that the discussion happened, that the elevation of those fundamental issues around the rule of law and independence uh, was in the public discourse for so long and still still actually is. And you're right, that conversation was a really big one and um, one that our viewers were part of. We, we covered this uh, intensively for a number of months. And I have to say, just from, I'm not an expert, from an honest perspective, you know, at the beginning there were a lot of people very, um, 
very tied to what you said and, and very sympathetic to what you were saying. When the, when the recording of that call came out, I noticed in, in the sort of reaction we got uh, from viewers, there was um, a lot of people questioning that. Do you regret that you, you recorded somebody, uh, a colleague of yours, without them knowing and then released it publicly? Well, I, I know that we haven't talked talked for a while, so I appreciate that you wanting to ask me these questions. As I said, I don't regret the actions that I took. Um, uh, that period of time and the circumstances around particular meetings or telephone conversations were extraordinary. It was an extraordinary circumstance and an extraordinary time where I felt I had to protect myself. Um, so I'm asking because it goes to the idea of trust, right? This, I, and that's something that both of you talked about, and, mm. and that you would, you know, you would be trustworthy for people, for constituents. And I think when you're talking about trust. I know that it was a long time ago, but I think it's still a relevant question. You know, you, uh, that, that seemed to turn the tables in caucus, most certainly. Well, I, I mean, certainly I, got, I received comments from caucus members. Um, I um, believe in trust and the maintenance of trust, and when trust is lost, it's hard to rebuild. Um, again, it was an extraordinary circumstance. I was the attorney general and faced successive uh, incidences of attempts to politically interfere in the independence of the justice system. And for many other reasons beyond that, which I articulated in my justice submissions, were the reason why I, I taped that conversation. I don't regret doing that. I regret that um, the uh, issue around SNC and the deferred prosecution agreement discussion got to the place that it did. Um, I wish it had been resolved very early on. I never wanted um, to be on the front page of the paper. I never expected that a story was going to come out. I know what happened and I relayed to Canadians what happened. And I want to turn that page. I'm excited about the next election. As I've said many times, I've provided all the relevant information um, that I have in terms of the uh, um, dynamics and the discussions around SNC. What other people have is, is what other people have. But for me, that information has been provided. And I want to focus on um, Vancouver Granville and uh, um, I know from, from the support that I've received, and I really um, uh, uh, acknowledge that support and thank people for sending me messages, who in the vast majority of those messages were thanking me for what I did throughout that entire time, um, up to and including today. Um, so I'm going to uh, take those messages of support and encouragement and work, as I always do, incredibly hard to earn the trust again of the people of Vancouver Granville. Well, best of luck in the campaign and thanks for coming by. I appreciate it. Thank you. That was part of our interview with former Cabinet Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould. The saga that started with tensions around the SNC-Lavalin case led to her announcement yesterday that she will run as an independent candidate this fall. What are her comments about the current state of party politics mean for the system in place right now? Time for the power panel. Stockwell Day, former cabinet, Conservative Cabinet Minister, I should say, is in Vancouver. iPolitics' Marika Walsh is with us from Toronto. And here with me in studio, Omar Khan of Hill & Knowlton Strategies and political commentator and former NDP MP Francoise Bovin. Hey, everybody. Nice hey, to see hey. you. So, so two sort of sections to this interview, and I should, I should preface it by telling our viewers that the reason I asked about some of the regrets and, and what had happened over SNC is because uh, she, she would not come on to do an interview during the whole thing. So uh, mm -hmm. there were some question, outstanding questions I thought needed to be asked. On the issue, Omar, of regrets, uh, it was clear that she doesn't regret her actions at all, but that she does. it was interesting to me that she regrets sort of how it all unfolded and, and the place we're at right now. What well, do you think I, about that? I think Canadians should regret the place we're at right now. Uh, we have a situation uh, where somebody who uh, professes, and she professed on your, on your show in the interview, to support progressive values, uh, uh, ha has done uh, everything she seemingly can to undermine what I think and what a lot of Canadians think is the, the most progressive prime minister we've had in quite some time. Uh, and to add insult to injury, uh, she is going to now run against a liberal candidate in that riding. Um, who, uh, uh, even though she professes, uh, at least, to share Liberal Party values uh, and support the Liberal Party ideology. So nothing she has done 
over the last five months, uh, including now, as you know, uh, has 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 done anything uh, to support or, or or move forward progressive values. Exactly the opposite. But what, what should she what, have done? Not said what she felt. Well, well, was the, well, like she thought she was standing up for the right thing. Should she not do that just because it risks undermining undermining well, someone's progressive well, values? Ultimately, what we have come, what, what what this has been all about, what what this really boils down to in the end, uh, is the fact that she was asked to seek a third party legal opinion. She she disagreed with being given that direction. Let's call it that. She felt that that was perhaps inappropriate. I don't think that the, putting the country and putting the party and putting uh, uh, the government through what she has done over the last five years, I don't think that is justified over a disagreement about a simple third party legal opinion. Okay, Francois, let's put aside the, the, what we've debated for, for many months on this show and let's just, let, let's talk about the other, so the, uh, I know that you're ready to jump in, but, but just, <laughs> but, but on that, let's talk, take the broader yes. issue of undermining uh, someone who is progressive and this idea that, uh, you know, not just the SNC scandal, but perhaps splitting the vote in those ridings Ugh. could enable somebody else, a conservative, uh, I'm so tired to be of, that, of that sentence that comes mostly by the liberals. I rarely heard it from anybody else. Sometimes Elizabeth May, maybe, uh, when she wants to vote on her side, and she'll have a different view depending on who she wants there. But I remember myself when I moved to the NDP from the liberals. And uh, some host, uh, I don't remember from which show, said to me, aren't you afraid you're going to split the liberal vote? And I remember very, very delicately answering, actually, I think the liberals are going to split my vote. And it's exactly <laughs> what happened because it was the bloc who was number one in the writing. And if the people had believed I could beat the, 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 the bloc instead of the liberal and voted, all the votes that were behind me, that were the liberals who finished third behind me, it's like, so I don't, I'm such not a believer of that sentence. If you believe in principle, if you want to stand up for your principle, the fact of who's going to be the leader, the prime minister, there's every vote count. It's either that or there, our system is, is a bunch of crap. And as long as we don't change the, the, the electoral reform, thank, thanks to the liberal who's, who claim and the prime minister that that would be our last election the way it went in 2015, which obviously w won't be because we'll still live it in 2019. Well, at some point in time, electors, voters have to stand and say something. Now, what's helping those parties is the fact that people are used to vote parties, but we feel that there's a tiredness toward this. So it might play on behalf of both Jane, Jane Philpott, maybe it's going to be a tougher route there, and Jody Wilson-Raybould, but to claim that because she might divide the vote and by presenting herself on, on things that she truly believe in, I think it's, it's kind of appalling to even think that. She will have to defend what she stands for, and that's no, it. No, i got to go to Stockwell. We'll get back to you, though. Stockwell, do you think it's appalling? I'm appalled by a couple of things here. Uh, Omar continues the vein that some would argue the Prime Minister started in terms of diminishing uh, a very significant woman. As long as uh, the woman in question, or any woman in question, is, uh, seems to be as progressive along what the Prime Minister says is progressive, and as long as she's towing the party long, line, as long as she doesn't contradict the male leader, you know, she's fine, she's a wonderful woman. And as soon as she turns from that, wow, she's just getting hit, and it, and it continues today. And I think Francoise is, is correct. There is a growing appetite among voters in general for people who will stand up and do what they think is right. And I'll tell you, there is an increasing revulsion for those who uh, you know, seem to want to take vengeance on those who stand up against their particular view of the universe. She has clearly said, no means no. And it seems that from the Prime Minister on down to and including the people that he sent to try and persuade her otherwise, they just don't understand that message. I think the voters are going to have the last say on this one. Marika, what do you think? Look, I think what Omar said about this idea of putting progressive values first, if that's what this is about, then either side could have backed down and neither side wanted to back down in this. And this is why we're here where we are now. So I think that's on, on both of them, if that's the angle that you want to take. I also think this idea of undermining you know, the vote and splitting the vote, and yes, the electoral math does get more complicated on the left, particularly in Markham-Stouffville, but 
as Francoise pointed out, that's because the Liberals didn't change the electoral system. So again, I'm not sure how that's necessarily on Jody Wilson-Raybould. Omar, I know you want to respond. You're, you're jumping in your seat. Yeah. <laughs> so I have no problem uh, with either Jody Wilson-Raybould or Jane Philpott running as independents. That is absolutely their right to do so. What I have a problem is when they come out and say, oh, we believe in liberal values and we're really proud of all these things that we accomplished, but we're going to spend five months undermining this government and we're going to run against their candidates. Oh, and by the way, we're open to working with Andrew Scheer, who doesn't stand for any of the things we've done. He doesn't stand for, he doesn't stand for pricing pollution. He doesn't stand for increasing the immigration rates. He does not stand for, the, uh, for, for lifting hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty through the child benefit. He doesn't stand for any of that. But to play devil's advocate, is it possible that as a person you could agree with the bulk of what the Liberals are doing, but you could also not agree with the way that this was handled, and you could say, exactly. I also for, I agree sure. with Conservatives on X and Y, I agree with and that is Greens their, that on is this. their right. The voters in those two writings will have the final say, and they're going to have to decide. They're going to have to decide, do we want to, you know, not, nobody is perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. We're all human. The Prime Minister is human. Do we want to stick with the Prime Minister who has uh, taken a leadership role across the world in moving forward a progressive policy agenda? Do we want to support that? Or do we want to throw our, our, our hat in uh, with two individuals who have done everything that they possibly can to undermine him and his government, which but includes many strong women over though. the past five months? That's, for me, again, is kind of the... <laughs> And not you, Omar, so I'm not attacking you, but it's kind of the uh, arrogance toward uh, from the liberals and sometimes from the conservatives as if there's only two parties. Because if you ask the question you just voiced, there's a lot of people who would say, well, I would see an NDP government. Another one would say, I'd see a green, a green party uh, government. So it's all in the eye of the beholder. It's just sheer way, sheer being a bad choice of word, but um, <laughs> it's just... the. the the way our system has been working for so many decades, and now the, the, the grand the parties are being threatened. We see it elsewhere in Canada. We see in my at province, level, yeah. at the provincial level, you see a party that everybody kind of laughed at for, for years, uh, Coalition Avenir Québec, suddenly becoming and, and strengthening their, their, their position of power uh, with each month. So it, It's not it, exactly totally made up. I mean, if you look at the polls right now, the, the two parties that are far out in the lead are the Conservatives and the Liberals. But and, and, it's shrinking. And, and they keep going, they, you know, prior to SNC. I, I do, I do agree are. with what you're saying. But at the same time, the liberals are, 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 are in a slump going down. Other parties might take the flack. We never know when a, par, a, a campaign starts, what's going to be. The, I, I, we were the government in waiting as NDP in 2015, not to say I haven't digested it. it, it. The liberals were dead. People yeah. imagine if they had merged with yeah, us. Right. Uh, I read Brian Toff's book that yeah. said the liberal party also, is dead. Is dead. Stockwell, exactly. Stockwell wants to jump in. Stockwell? What the polls are also showing, not just the Liberals plummeting, but they're showing among the, among the female vote, a number of polls are showing that Andrew Scheer and Justin Trudeau, in fact, are tied. And this is what really has the Liberals terrified. They're going, how can this be? When Jody Wilson-Raybould says she's committed to liberal values, she's talking about liberal in the classical sense, in the classical sense of small l. But the Prime Minister and Omar, apparently, are saying, no, 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 it's big L. It's capital L. And boy, oh boy, oh. or girl, girl, oh girl, if you're not committed to big L liberal and me as the boss, you're going to be in trouble. That's the message. Message is going out, and that's why the and that's why votes for Andrew Scheer among women are continuing to rise. No, I, I take your point, but I think I mean Jane Philpott, for example, explicitly said in her resignation letter that she agreed with the policies of the Liberal yeah. Party and the Liberal yeah. government, other than well, what had so happened here. So let, let's here. speak about motivation a little other, bit. Other Sorry, than, Marika, right, go other for it. Yeah. Well, that's why you know you jo Jody Wilson Raybould had those tough questions from you because they do have to square the circle in some ways and I think they are in some ways doing that but they do have to walk a fine line because they have to defend their record in the Liberal government and then they also have to stand as independent. So it's not an easy sell for them but I don't think it's an impossible sell. Well, you know, I, I'd like to ask, I, I think we all need to think about what, what are the potential motivations, motivating factors here. We, we have a history in the Westminster parliamentary system that cabinet ministers get to resign on a point of principle, and that's fine. What we don't 
allow and what, 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 what is not acceptable is to then do so, sit in a caucus and continuously undermine the government uh, of which you are ostensibly a member. That is what happened in this case. I would ask why. So we saw a tweet from uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould's father today suggesting that she'd be well, a great replacement for the, the Prime father, Minister. The sins I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that's what the, I don't know if that's the actually, motivating we factor. Followed, but, we followed but, up with him. He has not spoken to her. I mean, our enough. producer made a call. They have not spoken. And he, I think he, he said something. I'll, I'll get them to say in my ear, but something along the lines of, you know, I don't get she's her own person. I don't. I Absolutely. Don't her she's her do. own person. But, you know, I, 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 I think we should we should ask her, her and, and Miss Philpott. Did they call other cabinet ministers uh, when they were resigning? Did they ask them to support them? Did, uh, you know, w what were those conversations like if they did? So what are you trying occur? to say, that they're trying to take the prime minister down? I think it's pretty clear they were trying to take the you, prime minister down. He said he would never, the, uh, his, her father said he would never offer her political advice. Fair I enough. mean, it's hard, I mean, it's hard to ascribe motive, right? Like, the, like Jody wilson Rabel has been explicit that she felt like she was standing up for what she thought was right. And she said, even in the interview, she did not imagine that it would have unfolded. And I take your right. point that it did unfold the way it did. And it did end up, to, you know, to a degree hurting the prime minister very much so. But she didn't envision it happening that way. It's not like she set out to make that. Perhaps. Perhaps. And like, and said, like Jane yeah. Philpott said, he could have resolved it so easily. And I think what gives cre uh, credibility to Jody Wilson-Raybould actually is Jane Philpott, who's got no, I don't think it's in her DNA to, to be plotting against the prime minister it doesn't doesn't seem that way anyway uh, so uh, two persons who, who step down because of principle questions of principle as a lawyer I question what is happening over there and I think even as a liberal if I was still there I'd be asking question instead of just repeating the lines that the party gives everybody to say from anybody who's on on social media or anybody anywhere MP and, and so on. So I've got to take a commercial break. But and I, and I remember, just, there's been four women who've yeah, left the first. caucus now. Four liberal women who've left. Hi, I'm Vashi Capellos, host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video. Thanks for watching.